I met Emily in 2005. She was so energetic, so excited. We quickly became friends. She was more like a little sister to me. I have some stuff of hers that I've kept. Oh, that's not it. Oh, well, yeah, actually this. This was last Memorial Day, Memorial Day 2017. They had a beautiful picture of her and several other soldiers. And forgive me, I don't know the name of each of the other soldiers, but just to see Emily's smiling face, and that's what most of us remember about Emily is that wonderful smile. Emily Jasmine Tatum Perez, she was full of joy, but she had a deep, serious side to her also. Her passion was trying to make other people's lives better. I first met Emily, um, I guess in 2001. She was um, incredibly confident, um, incredibly beautiful, but she also had just this wonderful spirit about her. You could tell she just loved being alive um, and that she was probably going to um, make a big splash and a big impact wherever she went. This is her uh, high school photo album. And all her ribbons and stuff from when she was running track. She started playing basketball one year. And she was a tenacious defender, but she just couldn't shoot. But what we realized is that she was real fast. So we were like, okay, basketball is not your, your sport. You might want to try track. She wasn't a pushover. She was a very strong-willed child. Emily, in that, in that area of uh, that part of that makeup of Emily is really is her dad. I'm, I was a little, I'd say, uh, unreserved. Once you met Emily, you knew that she was going to be a leader. Now she got that from me. <laughs> I first met uh, Lieutenant Perez when she was still in training pants. This beautiful bundle of joy entered our lives and it was like a special gift. She was super driven. She's one of the smartest people that I've ever met. She was really, really funny. She had a great sense of humor. She was involved in a ton of activities. I just don't know where she got the energy. Oh, the AIDS ministry in the church? Oh man. Emily was the type of person when uh, she wanted something, taking no was not really, she'd give you, she would come to you with a proposal. Here are 101 reasons why we need to do this. I don't, I'm not gonna say she had to be in charge because she knew that a good leader had to be a good follower as well. But uh, it's somehow, you know how you, you know the people that you meet and once you're in the room, you know that uh, that's a leader and you know, and I, 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 I will follow her. I think that's what um, people saw. We talked about, uh, what are you going to do after high school? Where are you going? She was fixed on West Point. The camaraderie that I guess she saw while we were growing up, while she was growing up, she saw the same thing at West Point, and I think that's what kind of drew her to West Point because it was multicultural, diverse, because you got all different nationalities, you got all different people. She was a dual recruit because they were recruiting her for academics and uh, track. So that's what she did. We had a lot in common. She loved to read, so I think we bonded initially over just our love of books. We both, you know, we found that both of our, you know, um, dads were Puerto Rican guys from New York that had been in the Army, so, so you know, we kind of stick out in a crowd of mostly men. Her reputation as being really smart really preceded her. I think we were very supportive for each other, just 
being females there, being uh, women of color there. Um, so we just had a lot to always talk about, a lot to bond over. You know, she she definitely felt the you know the pressure to represent well because she didn't want anyone to even though they did question why she was in whatever place she was at. She had some challenges, uh, as you can probably imagine. One being a female, two being a minority. You know, I, I would sometimes every once in a while hear you know whispers of, well, she doesn't really deserve that, you know. You know, she doesn't deserve to have that good grade in that class. So she definitely was aware of those perceptions, and I feel like she worked, you know, two or three times as hard to make sure no one questioned, you know, why she um, was where she was. Sometimes things like that that would uh, be heard or whispered. But she still excelled, and one instructor called her an anomaly because they don't see kids like that come through there with the deck stacked against them, if you will, by, you know, being a minority, being a female in a male-dominated uh, school. And she graduated in the top 10% of her class. Yes, sir, ma'am. Who are you looking at me today? I just told him not to look up, not to look down, not to look left, not to look right. You will look at me when I am talking to you and try it again with that. Yes, sir, ma'am. You will not look up, you will not look down, you will not look left, you will not look right. You will look at the person you are addressing, that is a sign of respect. Move, Nugget, move! Question, you will now report to the cadet in the red sash. Pick up your back, put on your left shoulder, not your right shoulder, not your bum shoulder, but left shoulder. Move out and get out of my area, you better get out of my face quick, Nugget. You know, she definitely had a bigger impact than just the academy. I think she's also, you know, impacted, you know, how the Army looks at things as well. She made a lot of people just kind of question, you know, whatever kind of notions they might have had about, um, you know, either cadets of different backgrounds or athletes or, you know, women or, you know, women of color um, and just kind of what they, and women in general, what women should be like. We deployed in November 2005. We actually left um, the day after Thanksgiving. We deployed the day after Thanksgiving. I liked her because she came to us with, a, she was, you know, new ideas, uh, new innovations. She was excited. She was motivated. Um, she was eager to lead. We were in Najaf. Um, we were there for the first, um, probably about the first five to six months of the deployment. Um, the last five months, we had moved into Five Cal Sioux. And so once we moved into Cal Sioux, that was a, a lot more activity. Once we got into uh, combat, she did a lot of um, duties as a convoy commander, so she was on the road a lot. Archangel was a call sign that was used uh, because, again, we were a medical platoon. Um, and, and as a matter of fact, that was actually the platoon's uh, uh, code name was Archangels. And so uh, when they were on the radio, they would use that as their call sign. She was um, real spiritual. A lot of people talk about Emily's uh, accomplishments and all that she did, but Emily was a very faithful she had faith of a, of a woman well beyond her years. She was like a visitation with um, the scriptures personified. And unlike so many of us, she practiced uh, her faith very diligently. If you ask her why she, how she was able to do all the things that she did, and she said it's because of her faith, because God wanted wanted everyone to see what she does and what he did for her. Speaking to a lot of the soldiers who, I mean, they had a lot of respect for her and they, they loved her. Um, you know, they talked about, you know, how she would always lead all of her convoys and she always told me that. She would always be the number one vehicle. 
I got really comfortable uh, going on convoys with her. She would get in the truck and say, Truce, are we good to go? And I'd say, yes, ma'am, we're ready. And, and it, we just kind of had some confidence with each other. Lieutenant Perez, uh, I, I, I think that was always her choice, was always to be a lead. And I admired that. That's how a lot of it felt. If you were lead, um, you were just more prone to, uh, to get hit by an IED. And uh, I think uh, she knew that, but she led by, by example. Um, and uh, I, I like that, and I like being in her vehicle with her. I remember um, before she went out, just um, just saying, hey, I'll see when you get back, because, you know, it was just like any, you know, any other mission, you know, it was, you know, hey, be, be safe, I'll see when you get back. So I, I didn't think for one minute that that would be the last time I'd see her. We're towards the tail end of our deployment. This was September um, 12th. And uh, specifically, this convoy, they had um, the convoy wrote down as who was going from Charlie. And they had a, they had a gun for her. And uh, maybe I shouldn't have, but I erased their name and I just wrote my name on the board. And I've done it before and so did other soldiers. I just was confident in what I did and I was confident in her and I wanted to, I wanted to go. I want to say it's probably 2300 at night and we're uh we're going and we're not we're probably I, I guess we're 25 percent into our convoy and uh we made a left hand turn she said truth let me know whenever that trail vehicle makes a left of, you know behind us and then we'll know our whole convoy's on track and the last words that uh I remember seeing my lieutenant was uh, hey ma'am, uh, the trail made the left. It seemed like a second later we got hit. And instantly I knew it was an IED. It was, it was, it was hard, um, it was fast. It would be like uh, getting hit by a, a queen size mattress full of sand about 50 miles an hour. That's the only way I could explain it. I lost consciousness for a moment and uh, I kind of came to and uh, I yelled for my lieutenant. She didn't answer me. And I yelled for my my driver, Johnson. She didn't answer. I didn't hear anything from anyone. Just kind of made peace real quick with God. I think and said, "All right, this is it. This is this is my life." And so uh, I gave up momentarily, and uh, I just kind of sat there. The fire's kind of going, and I remember my right hand kind of twitched just a little bit, and. I thought, I, I still have my hand. And I remember just putting myself down real quick and I thought, I've got my legs. And I thought, man, I, I think I'm gonna be okay. And uh, I jumped up to grab the 50 cal machine gun and it was gone. Looked in the vehicle and um, basically everyone was slumped over. And so I got out of the top of the vehicle and uh, Johnson was our driver. And I got out and I remember I was screaming and I was flapping her glad. She looked up at me and I could tell that, you know, she was scared. And uh, she got out. At this time, we could hear small arms fire. And uh, in the back of my head, I thought at any moment, we're going to get rushed and we're going to get killed right here. Marco, our translator, his legs were, he was missing both of his legs. We dragged him backwards and we got him over this berm and uh, the truck's on fire and it just was in good visibility. And uh, Johnson, you know, says that we need to get Lieutenant Perez and I agree and we do. But at the same time, I knew whenever I looked in and I could see LT slumped over and our vehicle's on fire and she's not moving, she's not responding and her door was concave. That was, I think, probably one of the single most hardest uh, life decisions in my life. It wasn't that we chose one over the other. I just felt that LP was already gone. And at this point, uh, the best thing to do would be to save any human life that we could. Finally, I told Johnson, I said, look, I've got, one of us has got to go get help. 
And I said, I'm going to leave you here with my weapon. At this point, we only have one weapon between us. I got up and pretty much took off running um, to the closest convoy that was around us. I'm running the fastest I've ever ran in my life. And I remember I looked over my shoulder. It was Johnson um, just putting some rounds downrange to just uh, give me that additional cover. The medic bag comes in and um, our vehicle is fully engulfed. Um, you know, just on fire. Uh, I think we felt help- helpless and uh, our vehicle knowing that one of our own was in there. I was there that night, um, and so I heard the radio when the call came through that one of our convoys was hit. You know, no one really, they knew how close we were, so no one really wanted to tell me at that time who was it. Um, but I, w- I wouldn't leave until they told me. When I opened the door, it was the uh, uh, two military folks. One was the chaplain, the other one was an officer. I forgot their rank. And, and Emily had told us before, I, I mean, I knew because I'm prior military, but Emily had told her mother that if, you know, you open the door and there's two soldiers standing there, something's happened. Well, I already knew something had happened when I opened the door. So I looked at them and I said, you have the wrong house, and I closed the door and went on in the house. Finally, I went on and let them in, and that's when they kind of um, broke the news. And I called her that evening and, 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 and let her know she needed to come home. I want people to remember who she was. I want to keep her spirit alive. Her spirit will always be alive, but it it will always be alive in me. In anything that's of me, you know, I'm always going to talk about Emily. It it wasn't, I don't know, three days before I'm getting the information from her father. And uh, that was tough. The Lord knows I wanted a little girl. So I went out and bought, these are the first thing I bought while she was still in the womb. And my husband was like, it said it's a boy. I'm like, no, it's gonna be a girl. This is what I've kept all these years inside. One side is dear mom. And the other side is, Let's do, do that. Dear Mom, this is a thank you note for some of the things you've done. Thank you for teaching me how to bake brownies. I love you for all you've done for me. And then on the inside, she defines mother. Mother, terrific, wonderful, loving, caring, sharing. You are the best. Leading, preaching, working, intelligence, courageous mom. And that was her definition of mom. So the band that I wear, I wear this band all the time. I mean, to be honest with you, this is the second one I've had. The the first one faded so bad, but I still have it. Second Lieutenant Emily JT, and the JT stands for Jasmine Tatum. Perez. You also see here there is the painting um, of Lieutenant Perez um, that is in my house. My daughter's name is Emily. I spell it different to give her own, you know, to make her own individual, but uh, but her name comes from, uh, you know, Lieutenant Perez. Um, for me, my desire is that, you know, she knows um, the significance of the name. Um, and if she's half the young lady that that young lady was, I'll be proud. I think about LT all the time, maybe not daily, but weekly for sure. She had a huge impact on us. Always willing to do something to help you. She just wanted to, she wanted to do something to make the world, you know, better. She embodied, I think, the best of our values. And I think, I cannot speak for her parents, but Perhaps they cope uh, by being resolved. She did what she wanted to do. She loved what she was doing. 
She was all about everybody else. You didn't walk into Emily's presence and leave the same way. Whenever you walked into Emily's presence, you always left better than you were. She never thought about herself. She never looked for any accolades. She never looked for any spotlight. She didn't look for anything. As long as she was helping somebody else, that was her reward. I just want the young people, when they look and read or Google her, I want the young women to look at her and say, okay, just like Emily said, everything that I have done, I want, and that God has done through me, I want the young women, the young people to know that what I've done, that they can do this too and do even more.